I'm Susanna Clark, director of the Humanities, uh, Mahindra Humanities Center here at Harvard University. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's event, Writers Speak. The Writers Speak series is now in its sixth year. It is a series that has given us the opportunity to hear from stellar contemporary writers who read some of their work and engage us in literary conversation. Writers Speak is convened by Claire Massoud, who is an award-winning and acclaimed American novelist, and she is the Joseph Y. Bay and Janice Lee Senior Lecturer on Fiction here at Harvard University. Before handing things over to Claire to introduce today's event, I want to mention that on October 19th at 7 p.m., the Harvard Bookstore will be featuring Claire Massoud herself in conversation with uh, Andre Esman and Ruth Franklin about Claire's new book, Kant's Little Prussian Head and Other Reasons Why I Write, an autobiography in essays. The Mahindra Center is delighted to be co-sponsoring that particular event. And please check Harvard uh, Bookstore website an hour soon for details about registering. And now it is my great pleasure to hand things over to Claire Bissoud, who will introduce today's event. Claire. Thank you, Susanna, and welcome everyone. Uh, in, in an ideal world, we'd all be in a room together, but of course, in this time, the best is the enemy of the good, and I feel so fortunate that we can be gathered in this way uh, for the first of our Writers Speak events this season uh, to celebrate uh, Mark Visser and his new book, The Pink Line, Journeys Across the World's Queer Frontiers. Mark is a meticulous reporter, and he traveled the globe repeatedly for the better part of a decade, visiting over 20 countries and following the evolving, urgent, and often difficult stories of his diverse subjects. The Pink Line is being acclaimed around the English-speaking world. The Johannesburg Review of Books calls it a tour de force of scholarship. The Washington Post deems it hugely ambitious and exceptional. Colm Toibin, in his review for The Guardian newspaper, says it is valuable not only for the quality of Gavisser's analysis and the scope of his research, but because he spends time with the people on whose lives he focuses. He renders them in all their complexity. Toibin goes on to say that Gavisser becomes almost a novelist, and this too is part of the book's importance. Gavisser is an extraordinary reporter, but he's also a nuanced, sensitive, and beautiful writer, a compelling and compassionate storyteller who brings his subject's journeys unforgettably to life. Mark has won numerous prizes for his earlier books, which include A Legacy of Liberation, a biography of Tabo and Becky that was hailed by the TLS upon its publication as the finest piece of nonfiction to come out of South Africa since the end of apartheid, and his beautiful memoir, Lost and Found in Johannesburg. He writes for The Guardian, Granta Magazine, and The New York Times, and has a monthly column in the South African Business Day. Mark will be in conversation this evening with George Paul Mayu, a professor in the Anthropology and African and African American Studies departments. George Paul is the author of Ethno-Erotic Economies, Sexuality, Money, and Belonging in Kenya, and is currently working on a book entitled Queer Objects, Intimacy, Citizenship, and Rescue in Kenya. Now, before I turn it over to Paul, I just want to mention that if you, uh, if you have questions, you are welcome to, uh, to write them in the Q&A section at any time during the course of the conversation. Um, and also to let you know that there will be a link in the chat to purchase, uh, to purchase Mark's book. Uh, and that's with the help, I believe, of the Harvard Bookstore. So now it's, I'm going to turn it over to George Paul and to Mark. And thank you all for being with us this evening. George Paul. Thank you, Claire. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here and uh, to be in conversation with someone whose work I have uh, long admired. We are here, as you said, to discuss the pink line, a fascinating analysis of how questions of uh, sexual and gender identity have come globally to permeate the field of the political throughout the first two decades of the 21st century. And without any further ado, I want to uh, welcome Mark as well and invite him to start off the conversation by reading for us um, uh, from his new book. Thank you very much, George Paul and Claire. I've had the, um, the wonderful privilege of reading 
the manuscript of both your new books and um, to be commended by the two of you given how, how incisively and well you write is, is, is a great honor. So thank you for that. I'm going to read uh, from the prologue to my book, which is called A Debt to Love. Gaze Engage. This was the front page headline of the nation newspaper from the Central African country of Malawi on Saturday, December the 28th, 2009. Above it was a photograph of two people, blurry and uncomfortable in matching his and hers outfits cut from the same patterned wax print. Gay lovebirds, Tewonga Chimbalanga and Stephen Mongeza on Saturday made history when they spiced their festive season with an engagement ceremony, Chinkoswe, the article read, noting that this was, quote, the first recorded public activity for homosexuals in the country, unquote. Down the left side were some helpful fast facts. Homosexuality was illegal in Malawi and carried a maximum sentence of five or 14 years imprisonment with or without corporal punishment. Four and a half years later, in May 2014, I looked at this page with Tiwonga Chimbalanga. She had brought it into exile with her across 3,000 kilometers in four countries and tacked it onto the corrugated zinc wall of her shack in Tambo village, a township outside Cape Town. Although she displayed it, she objected to it too. I am not gay, I am a woman, she said to me in English before reverting to her native Chichewa. They told me I was gay when they arrested me. They told me that I was paid to do my chinkoswe by LGBTs from overseas. But the first time I heard the word gay was when I saw it next to that picture and when the policeman came and took me away. When I had arrived earlier, auntie, as Chimbalanga was universally known, had been waiting for me on the street in an elaborate purple ensemble with full skirts and turban, the kind of confection usually reserved for a chinkoswe back home. I thought she might have made the effort because she was receiving a visitor, but it turned out this was how she always dressed, so very much at odds with the lycra leggings style favored by local women in the sand-swept proletarian place. Auntie was tall and very dark with broad features and would have stood out anyway, even if she did not wear thick foundation to cover her facial hair, which gave her skin a silvery sheen. She was brittle and regal with a studied haughtiness, but I saw how quickly this could evaporate into a kind of girlish bashfulness when she was more relaxed or when she had cause to remember her life before people told her she was gay and took her away. This book is auntie's story and that of others from different parts of the world who have found themselves on what I've come to call the pink line, a human rights frontier that divided and described the world in an entirely new way in the first two decades of the 21st century. No global movement has caught fire as quickly as the one that came to be known as LGBT. The worlds auntie and I inhabited in 2014 were unimaginably different from how they'd been for each of us from such very different places, even a decade previously. Auntie's home in Tambo village is not 20 kilometers from the handsome century old bungalow overlooking the ocean where I wrote this book. My husband C and I bought it in 2012. We were married three years earlier in 2009, the same year that auntie held her chinkoswe but while her commitment ceremony brought her abject humiliation, a 14 year jail sentence and a life in unwanted exile, mine got me a much desired few years in Paris, spousal benefits from C's job and the same rights as any other married couple in our home country, South Africa. 
Thank you, Mark. What I found most captivating about, about the book, and this is so well illustrated in the, in the passage you just read, is how it moves with, with great ease from um, the life stories and daily struggles and aspirations of people like Andy um, to um, the wider political, economic, and legal structures then, uh, that then shape um, um, uh, who we are um, as subjects to the everyday, the mundane. So just in order to, to um, uh, start off the conversation for viewers who have not yet had a chance to read your book, let us talk a bit more about the framework of the pink line, a very compelling concept uh, for understanding uh, what has become a global political, social, cultural phenomenon or over, um, over the, the last two decades. Now, you describe the pink line as, uh, as you just read to us, as a, as a human rights frontier that divided and described the world in an entirely new way. Um, this line does not refer merely to the divide between, let's say, LGBT uh, rights advocates on the one hand, uh, and um, say, anti-homosexuality, anti-transgender nationalists on the other. It is something more complex. It includes that, but it is much more, it seems. Um, how do you understand this new global pink line? And what might the term help us see about the current uh, planetary order uh, that is otherwise less easily uh, distilled? Thank you, George Paul. That, um, I suppose the, 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 the idea for the pink line came to me when I compared um, my marriage and auntie's marriage. And I thought about the way auntie had had to cross what seemed to me to be a pink line to get from some kind of, well, she was, she was sent to jail and then she was pardoned thanks to a, a sort of global amnesty campaign led by Ban Ki-moon of the United Nations. And it seemed like she was moving from a, from a, a place of, of profound unfreedom to freedom by crossing this pink line. And I thought about how a pink line was, this, was a sort of new geopolitical concept that was dividing those parts of the world that were increasingly um, understanding and accepting uh, gender diverse and, and sexual orientation diverse people as full citizens and other parts of the world that were actually clamping down in new ways, in ways they hadn't before, um, in, in, a, in a form of backlash against um, what was perceived to be a, a really negative influence of Western decadent capitalism globalization, um, et cetera. And Auntie was a victim of that. So, so at its first level, the pink line, I, I understood as, as, as geopolitical. Um, but, but as I came to think about it, and, and I, had the, I had the freedom to do this because I don't need to be as rigorous a scholar as, as you in the academy do, um, I, it was clear to me that the pink line was, um, was, was, was a, a concept that divided, that not, not only ran between countries, um, and, and that became a, a new way um, that, that identity and nationhood and, um, and, and law and order were being defined and defended. Uh, a new way that, um, that the West was being defined as other by some and that other parts of the world were being defined as barbaric by others. Uh, the pink line was staked in complex ways, is staked in complex ways on, on both sides of the line. And we can talk about that. But I also came to, to, to understand the way the pink line sort of ran through countries and, and the United States with its interminable culture wars that um, you're experiencing now, again, is a clear example of that, how, how in one country you could have you know, the glory of marriage equality and then this raging debate as to whether um, children should be allowed to use bathrooms congruent with their gender identities. I, I, I came to see how the pink line, um, and this goes back to, to really the most, um, I think, compelling uh, explanations for how gay identity came about in the Industrial Revolution by historians like John D'Amelio, how the pink line is a line between between the city and the countryside, um, a, a line that is crossed in eras of, of mass migration when people unshackle themselves from, from feudal relations, from kith and kin to exercise what, what liberals call personal autonomy in the city uh, where they become productive members of, 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 of a capitalist system valued for, for their output rather than 
them needing to be con libidinally controlled. I came to see the pink line too as, as um, and I hold up my cell phone when I say this, the pink line is a line dividing some sort of in this era of, of, of the digital revolution, a line dividing um, the kind of online globalized liberation identity solace one might have if one's got a cell phone, a little bit of bandwidth and a little bit of privacy, a line between that and, 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 and what happens when you look up from your smartphone into the eyes of a, of a recriminating parent, a, a church that says you are possessed by the demon, a state that says what you're doing is illegal. And I think this is one of, one of the, the, the most important phenomena of the pink line, um, the way it, it creates this sort of dissonance in our era between an online liberation and, 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 and an offline constraint. And I'm really interested in, in, in the stories that I tell in, in trying to understand how the people I follow in, in all these different countries all over the world toggle between those two very different time zones in a way. Um, one where time is moving so quickly and the other where it is, where it is really dragging. I do want to come back to this issue of the of the pink line, not just crossing actual spaces or or groups of people, but somehow, as you just pointed out, somehow being internal to to the subject uh, as one moves between the, the, the social media and the, the the smartphone and social life uh, um, um, otherwise. Uh, but before I do that. You also mentioned at some point that the pink line is a line through time. It can uh, separate a past, let's say, for example, in, in nationalist contexts where it is assumed that uh, LGBTQ issues were not an issue before, but now because of globalization, um, uh, this has become an issue. And if one looks closely at the chronology of the events that come to shape this global phenomenon that is the pink line, uh, we see a growing, I, th I think, in my reading of your book, a growing intensification and proliferation of things throughout the past two decades. And I would even go further and say that um, it is really in the last decade, much more so in the first decade of the 21st century, um, that we start seeing anything from the celebration uh, um, across the globe, uh, kind of on similar terms of same-sex rights and gender affirmation rights, to um, the backlash of anti-homosexual legislation, panics over homosexuality, gender ideology, what have you. Um, so that these things somehow seem to be intensifying since 2009, 2000, 2008, 2009, when Uganda is, is passing um, uh, the bill and Russia is going to anti-propaganda law. So how do you explain this intensification and proliferation in terms of uh, the global order and shifts in the global order, global political uh, economy, and how would it uh, would would the pink line in this sense as a historical phenomenon phenomenon relate to questions of displacement and migration, uh, rising ethno nationalism, uh, anxieties over cultural boundaries, national borders, um, and uh, and what have you? Well, I, I, let let's answer that in two ways. One one is to go back to that that article that where it began, the article of Tiwonga Chimbalanga which stated that the Chinkosa was the first recorded public activity for homosexuals in the country. And um, the law that was used to prosecute Tawonga Chimbalanga, um, carnal uh, knowledge against the order of nature, an old British colonial law that just kind of slipped into to the, to the contemporary laws of so many, many modern nation states, had never previously been used against two consenting adults. And Tawonga and Stephen stood up and publicly announced their love to each other, and it seemed to be two men announcing their love to each other. So what was happening was that um, in societies where there, where there were different epistemologies, where, they were, where, where there have been different approaches to how one deals with sexuality, where, where, where sex, sex might be a form of behavior uh, rather than an identity, uh, then, then, then sexual orientation might be an identity. Things are changing and things are changing because of um, the vectors of globalization, because of the digital revolution, because of mass migration, because of um, commodity capitalism, because of the way um, an identity could now be sort of bought and owned. You know, this is the era of satellite television. So in a country like Malawi, um, 
you've got, uh, if people have satellites, they're able to toggle between, sort of at the time that Tewonge was arrested, between Will and Grace on, on, on one channel and, and, and Bileful Invective, either by Pat Robertson and the Christian Broadcasting Network, also being beamed from America, or, or perhaps uh, Wahhabi Islam being beamed from Saudi Arabia. All of these forces using um, the vectors of globalization for the first time. Um, you have people like Tewonge, like the people I write about all over the world, who, who, who get wise um, either, very, either actively or passively to this notion that, they, that, that who they are or, or who they desire actually accords them some rights that that um that they are that they have the right because people in other parts of the world have this right because it's an inalienable right as defined by the united nations they have the right to be free to be themselves and um and so they start claiming uh, sexual orientation as an identity in the way people have otherwise and that that works in a particular way in western liberal democracies because you claim that you claim that identity uh, so that you can make common cause with other people who have that identity and become a block, a constituency that can fight for rights. It, it works somewhat differently in societies that, that don't have that particular tradition of, of civil society or of multi-party democracy. So it also works somewhat differently in societies where um, there's intense emphasis on, on, on clan and on bloodline um, on belonging, on making children, on doing the right thing. And, and inevitably, there's going to be some sort of cultural crisis because of this, as, as, as people stand up and say, well, these are rights that people have elsewhere. Uh, I, I don't see why I, as, as a, a woman who loves other women and likes to wear, to shave my head and wear jeans, should have to wear a dress and get married and have a dozen children. I, I'm going to state my my right to be a butch lesbian. And, and automatically when you do that, of course you're challenging the patriarchy and, and, and you're, 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 you're creating trouble for patriarchs and priests who, who, who no longer can control things in the same way. This at a time of, of major national anxiety, precisely because of globalization, where, where, where leaders from Vladimir Putin to the prime minister of Malawi, um, don't feel they have control over their subjects anymore because of this era of globalization. And we see, we've seen how that's played out so powerfully, so toxically in, um, in nativist politics in this, in this century. So what do you do is you begin to define the nation against the other. And what has been particularly easy, particularly in Eastern Europe and in Africa, the Caribbean and parts of Africa, is to find what, what um, uh, at least for for religious orders is one of, is one of the most offensive um, markers of this new global spirit, and that is homosexuality, LGBT rights, the freakishness of transgenderism, and to make that the other against which we have to defend our societies. So putting up barriers against against the West, against the neo-colonial West, against Europe in the case of, of Russia, because of course, when you wanted to join, if you wanted to join the U European Union, you had to say that you were pro LGBT rights. So, so one of the ways for, for, for leaders like Putin or Orban or, or Andrzej Duda now in, in Poland to say, we are not European is to say, this is not part of our culture, we reject it. And this is in fact, what makes us Russian. This is what makes us African. This is what makes us Brazilian in the case of Jair Bolsonaro. Yeah. So there is something about the pink line in this in this case where um, the terms or the grammars of it, the fact that, as you say, you know, the homosexual suddenly becomes hyper visible as a target against which to to protect the nation, protect the citizens, and so on. Um, there is a certain kind of modularity to that across the globe. It seems the fact that the same it happens in more or less the same way in Russia as it happens in Poland, as it happens in in Uganda or Malawi. Um, as it happened in Miami, as it happened as in it, Miami with Anita absolutely. Bryant, um, as, it, as it happened in the United Kingdom with, with Margaret Thatcher, Thatcher's Section 28. I mean, yes, you're absolutely right. And, and, and what's interesting about this is that the, the playbook for this comes from 
the American religious right. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things I track in my book is, is the way um, the way there was a sort of co cross pollination between between American right wing evangelists and and people in the Russian Orthodox Church who were connected to Putin's United Russia Party, party that, that really um, germinated this notion of the anti-gay propaganda act in Russia. Yeah, absolutely. And what, what is also interesting in that moment is how, how subjects come uh, into the pink line, if you will. How somebody like Auntie uh, Chimbalanga, uh, there's this beautiful moment in the opening of the book where you say, where you quote uh, her say, that the first time she heard the word gay or heard herself being referred to as gay was when the police was putting her in a car, arresting her basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's an interesting kind of entrance point, how it produces subjects, which leads me back to the question of the subject here and, and how the, the pink line is not just out there, but it's somehow within the process of being, within negotiating space, time, imagining a future and so on. And on page 24, you have, this this uh, excerpt, I'm, I'm just going to read a bit from it, where you say that the pink line is not so much a line as a territory. It is a borderland where queer people try to reconcile the liberation and community they might have experienced online and on TV uh, with the constraints of the streets and the workspace. It is a place where queer people shuttle across time zones each time they look up from their smartphones that people gathered around the family table and so on. And what I loved about this passage is, and, and, and you brought this up uh, just before as well, is that it shows how the pink line is organizing um, um, a, a personal sense of identity, a, a sense of private, uh, a private space and time. How does this, uh, how did you encounter this uh, in the different contexts in which you work, in the stories uh, that different people told you? Um, did this play out differently? Well, I suppose let me, um, let me answer that by taking a step back, which is to say that the, the, the concept of the pink line might have come to me when I compared my marriage and Tawonga's engagement ceremony. But it, it didn't organize the way I reported and researched this book. I kind of knew that there was this global human rights frontier that I wanted to understand. I knew that I wanted to go to places uh, where, where the pink line, where pink line politics were particularly sharp or particularly inflamed. And really what I did in those places is, is I met people in the way that journalists do, um, you know, with, with these ever expanding webs of networks, I guess in the way that ethnographers do too, that anthropologists do too. And, um, and it was really through that experience that I came to, to understand the pink line as a territory rather than a, than a line. Because what I came to see is, is that the people I was, I was writing about and getting to know um, over the course of years in, in these very different countries from, from India to a very different context from a fishing village in India to, to Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is, which is one of my sites of study from, from, from uh, Cape Town where I met auntie to, to Moscow, from, from Egypt to Israel, Palestine, um, was, was, was watching the way people, the queer people I was writing about, and I should say they didn't always call themselves queer, they often didn't call themselves queer, that's a word I give to them, um, the way they were, they were living in this zone of, 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 of dissonance, of shuttle, of, um, of, of possibility, but then clamped down, of, of, of claiming freedom, but then having to defend it. Of, um, I mean, an example of a pink line that for me remains particularly strong is a, is, is a gay church I went to in Ibadan in Southeast Nigeria. Um, and, and to enter this church, Everybody had to, it was a sort of on the outskirts of town, you had to sort of go through a junkyard to get to it. And I watched everyone arrive looking very sort of buttoned down and neat and quite heteronormative, as, as heteronormative as queens can look. And, and they would come to this, to this gate um, in, in a housing complex, a locked gate, and they would be spied through the gate. And if they were recognized, the gate would be open, they would come in. And as soon as they entered the space, this dingy space that had some chairs laid out in a pulpit, I mean, they literally shed their clothes of the street and became themselves. And, and then there was this amazing, this amazing process of, of becoming 
their true selves as they saw it for them to be able to worship their gods. And, and I came to see that, that locked gate in this housing estate as a pink line that had to be crossed. It was, and that was pretty dangerous for them to cross coming and going because then you have to sort of regulate yourself, right? When you leave and you go back into the street, like you have to put the freedom back into a box. Um, I write about, about Michael Bashaija, a, a young uh, Ugandan refugee who I follow all the way from Kampala to Nairobi and to Vancouver in Canada, where he is now. And when I met him in Nairobi, I watched the way, I mean, he had these very girlish um, uh, hair extensions. And I watched the way he, he needed these hair extensions to be able to express himself. But he had to sort of pack them up into a beanie whenever he went onto the street. And he had to kind of, and he, he kept on being beaten up, in fact, in, 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 in Nairobi for quote unquote, walking girly. Um, and he had to learn how to sort of walk in a more masculine way on the street. Um, but, he, but he had the option in a way that, that people in previous generations didn't of, 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 of spaces where he could really um, experiment with online spaces and offline spaces, experiment with like just gloriously walking girly. And that is, that is, a, that is a mark of our age. But it causes problems because then you think it's okay to walk girly and you're in the streets and you forget that actually you've got to button yourself down again. And I, it, just your description now of, of Michael makes me think of continuities here with um, other kinds of lines that the picking line comes to intersect with panics over gender and, and especially the recent mini skirt bill in, in Uganda, but also uh, attacks on women dressed scantily and so on. But also the notion of, of what you described for Nigeria, the closed doors where behind you suddenly can become something else that might also seem continuous at a different magnitude, of course, with social life more differently. I, some of my work in, with, with sex workers on the Kenyan coast is quite similar. When can you show dress in a certain way that makes you recognizable as a sex worker and how do you present yourself when you go into uh, a neighborhood where you have to be respectable but of course the magnitude the the intensity of this is, is a pro perhaps of a, of a different um, but the, but also the magnitude and the intensity absolutely and when, when you say magnitude and intensity um, I would also say scope because you've got like a global archive of images you can refer to right um, because of being able to go online. I mean, so you write, you write in, your, in your upcoming work quite beautifully about how a, a young Samburu queen gets outed by a member of parliament in Northern Kenya because, because she, he is wearing beads, which are usually in that culture worn by women, right? Um, and, and it's such an interesting question to me about about where let's call let's call her she because you say in, you say yeah. in your in your manuscript that you would call this person transgender even though the person outing the MP outing this person calls calls her gay um, where that idea comes from to wear the beads but what else is available for somebody like that to wear given given yeah. access to the internet and 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 how how certain global fashions um, certain global styles of voguing um, uh, become Be Beyonce. I mean, in almost every country I, I worked in on this project, I met a, a big, fierce trans woman called Beyonce. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and what Beyonce meant to all of them was, was, um, was very different. But, but there is this kind of global archive that can be, can be referred to now. Um, but that's immensely, that, that's threatening to nativists, but can also be used by nativists. Right? Absolutely. This is, the, yeah. this is the culture that's contaminating us. Yeah, yeah. The foreign thing becoming indigenous in some, some way dangerously so um, before we continue I just want to remind everyone um, you can submit questions in the Q&A box and towards the end of conversation we'll, uh, I'll start um, taking as many questions as, as possible and also to remind you that the link um, to purchasing a copy of the pink line is in the chat.
Um, Mark, let me um, move now to another aspect of the pink line that I think is, is important to talk about. Um, so that even if in many places, as you show, the pink line starts off as being about human rights issues, um, it, it, the, the description that you provide shows how it, it realizes itself in the economy in one way or another. Um, on the one hand, for example, you have the corporations, including banks, who uh, perform their support for LGBT rights um, uh, to brand themselves in, in novel ways. And here you have the whole debate about the pink dollars of the affluent gay middle class who can uh, animate the tourism and real estate industry and so on. And you covered this beautifully in chapter 10. On the other hand, you also bring to light how gay money, quote unquote, the scare over gay money in places where NGOs are that support uh, LGBT um, um, folks uh, also becomes an issue. Beyond these fears, you also show how in Malawi, for example, there is a a, a booming microeconomy, uh, and I quote you here saying that uh, lawyers, journalists, and priests, all allegedly straight, jetting off to Geneva to talk about LGBT rights at the human, uh, UN Human Rights Council, or being funded to run sensitization workshops or even place articles in local media. Um, can we think of the pink line as an economy? Um, one in which sexual and gender identities are not only about rights or some sort of immutable identities, but also um, commodified, tied through flows of capital. I think we have to. I mean, it, it, I think it's it, it, it's obvious. And and I, I really came to understand that myself because um, I was able to do this book thanks to an incredibly generous uh, fellowship from the Open Society Foundations from George Soros, who who is considered in many parts of the world to be evil precisely because he promotes these ideas. And indeed, um, uh, the Open Society Foundations is really one of, one of the philanthropies that, that does the most globally to, um, to, to advocate for the rights of LGBTQ people. Now, what this meant is, is that when I entered any space as, 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 as a researcher and as an Open Society Fellow, doors were open to me in a particular way that was, um, you know, it was, it was very helpful I didn't have money to dispense, but I, I was associated um, with 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 a metropolis that does have money to spend in this in in this new um, economy, um, and that that in a way um, made my work it opened doors, but it made my work complicated as well. And I try and I try and understand that. I try and understand how if um, I if if it if 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 the pink line is 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 a consequence of these vectors of globalization, how how going into these spaces, I myself um, am or am perceived to be one of those vectors. And in fact, um, in the cases of both Michael and Auntie, I write about this. Um, I, I I crossed a boundary that I wouldn't normally cross as a journalist uh, because I saw people in desperate need and I thought I could help them. And in Michael's case, the way I helped him was by, by trying to get him into school, um, because he was he was a kid who'd been thrown out of home and um, and who who was really lost and struggling, and it was so clear he needed to be in a safe environment where where he could better himself. So so when a cap was passed around to put him into school, I I put some of my dollars into that cap. This automatically kind of shifted our relationship in a very complex way because I was. I was now a benefactor. Um, and not only was I perceived by him to be a benefactor, but by others too. And remember what I was doing is exactly what the queer phobes or the homophobes in countries like Uganda say is the problem. I was coming to Uganda and paying this young man to be gay is, is, is the way it would be perceived by Michael's father. Yeah. In fact, when, when Michael was brought home by, by somebody else who tried to save him once, he, he asked the question, are you the ones who paid my son to be gay? There is this notion, and, and you know this so well from your own work, there is this notion that, um, that the sexual identity is, is, is very much a, a commercial and transactive proposition. And one of the reasons why this is the case, particularly in part, is because of another phenomenon of globalization, which is tourism. And a subset of tourism, of course, is sex tourism. Goes without saying. Um, now, now, there, there, there's a school of thought. There's a, there's a, there's a very famous um, essay by, 
by the Palestinian academic Joseph Massad, um, which, which says that there is a gay international, which is, a, which is an international economy of people like me, of people like you, of people like the people who work for George Soros, who, who, who have an agenda of disrupting um, sexual systems in other parts of the world, really so that they can um, find vassals to fund and um, young men to have sex with. And um, I, I find that a, a profoundly offensive concept. And the reason why I do is because I think it does um, exactly uh, what the people who say um, homosexuality is un-African do, which is it denies the agency of the people I write about on the pink line, of people in Kenya, of people in India, of people like Tawonga Chimbalanga who make their own choices. Um, now, it, it, it's, a, it's a philosophical debate we can have uh, about freedom of choice in, in, in the capitalist globalist society. Do, do, do these, are, are these people subjects who, are, who have basically been invaded by, by, by Western ideas and economies, or are they looking for ways um, to improve themselves? to um, make their lives better according to, um, according to what they see and what they find, what they, what they can take in, 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 the, in their hybrid identities. So, so I do believe it, it is a, the, it, there, is a, there is a pink line economy. Um, I, I am not so sure if I would call it an exploitative economy in the way that either Joseph Mess said, um, or um, African or Russian nativists would. Yeah, no, and, and on top of the, the denial of agency in the kind of Mossad argument, on top of that, there is also a kind of um, erasure of a history of both colonialism and after colonialism, the AIDS pandemic, um, various forms of sexual commodification that have globalized the terms of of gender and sexuality long before the pink line. Uh, but you have to right. remember as well, um, George Paul, of course, that the AIDS pandemic is, 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 is its own pink line economy yeah. and a really powerful one because, I mean, all over the world, uh, one of the ways that, um, that LGBT uh, organizations began and that people began to define themselves as LGBT or gay or, or even transgender was because of the space that was created under the public health umbrella um, for men who have sex with men originally to organize themselves because they were seen as, as, as key vectors of the epidemic. And, and it, was, it was an article of faith, particularly of the World Health Organization and UNAIDS, that you can't reach these people if they're underground. Um, so, so what would happen is, is that funding poured in in places in, in, in many parts of Africa and Asia and Latin America to establish organizations that, that were immensely successful in some instances, in, in India, for example, at, at stemming the flow of the epidemic um, by reaching this huge population of men who have sex with men. But this, had, um, this meant that there, was, that there was this capital flowing to a previously stigmatized or invisible group of people um, who, who were no longer invisible, who were now hyper-visible because capital was flowing to them because they stood up at AIDS, AIDS conferences, you know, yeah. in, in really nice clothing um, and, 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 and spoke about their identity. So they became kind of demonized as a, as a new kind of folk devil. And there was, um, there was, there was a sort of moral panic in, in some countries like Senegal, like Indonesia, as a result of the way the AIDS epidemic um, kind of caused capital flows uh, towards this, this, these communities. Absolutely, and I think, I think that this, this visibility of the capital flow, of the, of the gay money, quote unquote, uh, not just because the subjects themselves were suddenly visible, but the kind of houses they would build, the kind of uh, uh, buildings that the uh, clinics would have uh, that, 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 that help MSM, uh, in, the, in the parlance of public health and so on. Um, so that some of these, these clinics have become the target. It, it, that was the case certainly on the, on the Kenyan coast in 2010, mm -hmm. when the, the building of, of, of a medical organization was, was attacked precisely because of those flows of, of wealth. Before I open up, and we have a, a, quite a, a few questions coming in already, 
let me ask one more, uh, one final question, one that interests me uh, specifically as an anthropologist myself, um, namely um, that of your, of your research method and how did you start, probably method is too formally put, uh, you know, as, as anthropologists, we can be quite picky and we think we can work in a place for a whole life, uh, do ethnography and it's never enough. The kind of argument you make about the pink line requires a different methodology. It requires to pursue the modularity, but also the kind of contingency of what it, how it plays out in different contexts globally. It could not have been done just in South Africa or just in the US. You had no. to, to travel and you traveled widely. Um, yeah. I mean, George you, Soros is, yeah, sorry, carry on. No, just how did you do it, uh, is my question. And how did George you manage Soros to, is, yeah? How did you manage to kind of combine so well the kind of ethnographic detail of the mundane with the kind of larger analysis of the political structures across so many continents? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite relieved to hear that you think I did combine it well because it was one of my major anxieties. Um, um, you know, George Soros wasn't that generous. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was not able to sort of travel the world repeatedly for a decade to these 10 different places, where, 10 different people who, who I write about. Um, I, I met most of them three times, twice, sometimes only once, but for very intensive periods. And then I remained very much in touch with them in between and afterwards online. And, um, and that of course, you know, uh, social media is it's, uh, uh, opens things up, but also occludes things because, because people don't, people present a version of themselves online. Um, it's, it's it, observing someone online is very different to observing someone going about their daily business in their village. Or, 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 or in their home city. Um, but that kind of suited me because I, I was writing about um, these constructed online identities and the relationship between these constructed online identities and, and, and what happens offline. Um, and, and, and while I was online with these people, you know, there, were, there were periods where we had sort of intense one-on-one -on -one conversations and catch-ups as, as well as my just following them. Um, so, so yeah, that, that obviously I, I mean, I, I very much didn't want to be the kind of foreign correspondent who zooms in, interviews somebody, zooms out and, and is an authority on the subject, but, but, but evidently I, I'm not an authority on all these places I visited and, and I don't mean to be. Um, I suppose another thing that I really hold to, and this is, this is, um, this, this, this is sort of deeply embedded in me after sort of two and a half decades of working as a journalist is, is the, um, I mean, it sounds pretty old fashioned, but the sort of the primacy of people and, and really um, using the tools of my trade, which are also the tools of humanism uh, to understand people. And, you know, pri prime, the primary tool, of course, is empathy and, and trying to to sit quietly in a corner and, and, and see the world the way the person you're writing about sees the world. And then not wanting to burden the people I was writing about too much with all these big ideas, and which, is, which is really what led to the structure of the book, which is an interleaving of these, of these deep dives, these, these very intense stories of, of people like Michael in Uganda or Auntie in Malawi, um, or Pasha, the transgender woman I write about in Russia, or the lesbian couple who opened a, um, a shisha bar, a sidewalk cafe in Cairo, sort of interleaving those with, with, with more discursive distant chapters uh, that are more analytical precisely so that the people I'm writing about were not kind of weighed down by the baggage of all this analysis so that they could breathe and that you could, you could really be with them as the reader. And you also show beautifully how sometimes your path separated with your interlocutors, how sometimes they decided like the US teens that you described to tell their own stories and your, your conversation ended and you, or with Michael at some point also, you show in a way how that intersubjective space 
um, was produced, which I find quite interesting. Let's uh, take a few question, uh, questions here and let me start with this one, which I know you're covering very well in, in, the, in the, the core of the book. What do you think about pinkwashing? Um, the term and and its use uh, of um, um, in the performance of kind of a openness of LGBTQ culture in Israel um, in relation to the politics in Palestine. I know the, you, a lot of the book, uh, or, or important part of the book, covers covers that and pursues uh, Israeli and Palestinian queers uh, across different spaces. So yes, I, thanks for that question. I have a, a whole chapter. Um, that is set in Palestine and Israel, uh, called Fadi and Nadav's story. And the reason I went to Israel is because I was really interested in the way in Israel and Palestine, uh, a pink line is sort of traced over the green line that separates um, 1948 Israel from the occupied territories. And, and the way that, that it, Israel pinkwashes its human rights record um, uh, when it comes to Palestinians, but by promoting itself as being very pro-gay, as being this sort of oasis of tolerance and civility in an otherwise rough neighborhood. Um, and in so doing, presents itself as, as more palatable um, to people in the West who might otherwise be critical or doubtful about, about what happens in Palestine. Now, that's one side of the story. The other side of the story is, is that if, if Israel is using um, LGBT rights in that way, and it's absolutely clear that it is. And if you have any doubts, please read my chapter. You can imagine what the Palestinian nationalist movement thinks of LGBT rights over and above whatever sort of cultural or religious um, uh, uh, concerns that, um, that people might have about, about gayism. Uh, you can imagine how in Palestine um, being gay is, is a mark of Cain, is, 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 is a mark of being a collaborator. And Israel actually plays a role in, in fomenting that because of the way um, it turns. And I tell the story of a young man in my book called Nabil, who, who is who the, the Shin Bet, the Israeli Secret Service, Security Service, actually tried to turn. Once they discovered he was gay, they discovered him with his Jewish Israeli boyfriend. And he was blackmailed. He was told, if you don't inform on what's happening at Birzeit University, we're going to expose the fact that you are sleeping with an Israeli Jewish man to your family in Nablus. Now, what, what Nabil did is, is he fled to Canada. But, but other Palestinians um, have stayed and, and have the reputation of being collaborators. So, so what I was interested in, OK, that's the big politics of it, right? What I was interested in is, is what does it mean to live on that pink line? What, is that, what does it mean to be Palestinian and queer? So I tell the, 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 the key person in that chapter is, is an amazing young man called Fadi, uh, who is a nurse in Tel Aviv, and who, who describes in sort of an, an achingly articulate language what it's like to be celebrated for being gay, because he lives in Israel. He was born within the borders of Israel, so he has all these rights as a gay man. What it's like to be celebrated for being gay, but denigrated um, and rendered a second-class citizen for being Palestinian. That's a very particular pink line borderland that he lives on. Thank you. Let's move to another question that brings us back to the longer, the question of a longer historicity here of the pink line, which we talked about briefly. How does understanding gender and heterosexism as products of a modernist colonial project shift our understanding of the pink line, uh, especially when the pink line is framed through the lens of globalization? Um, do we understand the question is, are we, are we tra having here a longer history uh, to the pink line that goes back to the heterosexism and particular kind of gender imaginaries of colonialism? I think so. Um, certainly, um, well, I mean, the pink line in one respect, I, I trace all the way back to Tudor England, uh, where, where, where um, anti-homosexual, anti homosexual anti-homosexual moral panic was used uh, by Henry VIII to raid the monasteries, which were dens of homosexualism. He really didn't give a damn about homosexuality. Mm -hmm. He wanted the gold. Um, but but so, so that's, on, that's on one side. Certainly, um, 
certainly the colonial order, um, if I understand the question correctly, um, uh, which was a Victorian order and which was a Judeo-Christian order, um, brought, cert brought a whole bunch of um, legislated gender norms um, to societies uh, where there had been different gender norms um, and, and, and very strict rules about what, what was normative and what wasn't normative. Um, um, there's very interesting writing that I, that I respect, uh, both about pre-colonial Africa and about the pre-colonial Americas, which warns against what might be called Afro-Romanticism. Um, the, the, I'm not an authority at all on, on pre-colonial um, American societies, but, but from what I've read, um, the gender relations in any particular clan or nation um, determined whether gender nonconformity would be acceptable or not. So in, in societies where women were subservient, uh, gender nonconforming men did not have very much right and rights and power. Um, in societies where there was gender equality, uh, there was more acceptance and openness to, to this. Uh, in, in, in my part of the world, South Africa, there's a, a really interesting tradition um, that has been appropriated by, by many young trans and queer people, which is, is that traditional societies, um, uh, if, you, if you presented, if you were born female, but present, presented in a very male way, one of the ways that this might be understood is, is that you were very close to a male ancestor, right? And, and this, this means that, this might mean that you're bewitched and get you into a lot of trouble, but it might also mean uh, that you're blessed and that you have divine power. And so there's a really interesting phenomenon of, of space uh, within, within the faith structure for gender nonconforming or queer people that is being reclaimed now. We have another question that actually uh, already echoes some of the answers that you you gave, uh, and it revolves around um, how does this play out in places where pre-colonial cultures and societies allowed for a lot of gender freedom or, or fluidity outside the binary, uh, and in in these cases, in this in these places, are these pink lines seen as a global invasion? I don't know if uh, if you might want to talk a bit about the Indian example, which we didn't get to talk about, where you're you're looking at even the the formalization of the notion of the third gender mm. and how transgender rights uh, uh, issues formalize things further uh, in that Thank context. you for that question. I mean, the, the, the whole last section of my book, which is, which is largely set in India, but also in the Philippines, uh, asks that very question. And it's been really interesting for me um, to, to look at what happens in societies where there, there are these age-old uh, gender categories and where gender has always been understood to be more of a spectrum. What happens in these societies uh, when a, a, a new notion, a notion from the West comes that is, that is rights-based and, and biomedical. It's about transforming your body medically. Um, what happens when a rights-based and my biomedical um, definition of identity comes into contact with or, or conflict with um, a, a sort of social or cultural identity or space that a third gender person has. And, and, and one of the, I mean, I do write about India, but, but, but I feel that, that the Philippines example is perhaps the, the quicker and clearer way of explaining this, how in the Philippines there have always been bakla. And bakla means man, woman. And, and the F Filipino society is really open to bakla um, and there are, there's a bakla hairdresser on every corner. Every, every, every little neighborhood has a beauty pageant where the local baklas compete. The F Filipinos love their bakla. There's, there's, there's no real problem with bakla, but bakla have a very particular space in society. That they really can't get out of that space of the beauty industry. Um, along comes the transgender movement 
um, that says, uh, don't think of yourselves as buckler. Start thinking of yourselves as women and claim the space and the rights that all women have, including running for Congress and even becoming a Congresswoman. There is in fact a, a transgendered Congresswoman in the Philippines at the moment. You don't need to stay in this muddy middle that you occupy, actually cross over, cross the binary, cross over the binary and, 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 and claim your rights and claim more space in society. And you can see how empowering that might be, but how, what that does, um, what that does to certain notions of fluidity. Um, in, in India, people are claiming rights as transgender people as never before, and, it, and, it, and it's really powerful and really valuable uh, in terms of how it's influencing the politics of India. But at the same time, um, uh, the question has to be asked, what, what does this do whether it's for the better or the worse to the to these age-old spaces i could tell the story of senegal where where as a result of this this phenomenon um uh Gorgigen, who are which also means men women have have pretty much disappeared uh, as a consequence of of a sort of new global lgbt visibility uh, the way the whole arch of the book moves in a way from uh, the LGB towards the T at the end, you said, is also a historical shift, a shift from uh, a, a main focus on, on questions of, of sexual identity to questions of, of gender and, and the culture wars uh, that, that's around that. And one question that I was going to uh, ask you is, well, where, where, where do you see it go from here? Mm. But somebody actually asked the question much better because actually it also uh, resonates with your current interest in, in the COVID COVID-19. Um, uh, it asks, um, the question asks, I'm wondering if you have any sense yet of how COVID-19 pan pandemic will impact the shape and contour of the pink line, whether globally, regionally, or in terms of uh, the particular individuals that you uh, write about in your book. Yeah, I mean, there's, there, there, there are many ways of answering that. Um, and really, we're, we're in the middle of something, so it's, it's very hard to, to prognosticate. Um, um, certainly, there is much evidence of, of how vulnerable queer people have been in particular as a consequence of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and I'm thinking specifically of, of gender non-conforming people, of people who are not able to remain comfortably sheltered at home uh, of people who have no option but to earn their livings on the street. Uh, what happens uh, when that public space is constrained uh, for public health reasons? Uh, Lakshya, the main, the, 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 my main subject in India, um, who, who, who earns her living begging, which is what Tra many transgender people do in in India was not able to earn for for many months as a result of this and 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 was really in in a very bad situation um there's a, there's something i'm reporting on right now in Uganda which is is that at the very beginning of the lockdown um the authorities took advantage of the lockdown to raid an lgbt homeless shelter and arrest 23 people and, and lock them up on the pretext that they were disobeying uh, the rules of the lockdown, which they clearly weren't. Um, and, and these people were, were subject to, to pretty horrific torture and treatment and not allowed to see their, um, their legal representatives for, for, for something like 50 days. And there's in fact, a, 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 they, there's, there's a really, really, really powerful um, human rights legal fraternity in Uganda, and there's a civil suit against the, the, the prison officials and the civic officials who did this that's coming to court in Uganda next week, in fact. So it's something to watch. Um, I mean, on, on, an, on another very different level, um, I mean, I, I've spoken in, in this, in this discussion about uh, living in two time zones mm -hmm. and, the, and the comfort and, and, um, 
and solace and information that we get online as opposed to the exigencies of offline life um, and, and that being a sort of queer condition. Well, isn't that the condition of all of us right now? Isn't that the condition of us sitting here right now, you know, sharing these ideas in the comfort of our own homes with enough broadband to be part of this conversation, but absolutely horrified and terrified about what's going on outside that we have to face uh, when, we, um, when we walk outside and make a decision to wear our masks or not wear our masks or protest or not protest or, or when we're faced with people who, who, who are not able to earn because economies have collapsed. Um, so there's a way that um, the queer condition is of these two time zones um, and needing to toggle between them is, is, is the condition of us all. Um, in terms of how nativist politics might, might sharpen around the pink line um, in times to come, um, and in times of duress, because we are heading into times of terrible duress. I mean, we'll have to see. Uh, it's interesting to me how these issues are not playing at all, or very, 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 very lightly in, in the current American election. That's interesting to me. But um, we should look at the Polish election, uh, which took place a few weeks ago, where, where the winning um, party Andre Duda's party campaigned on an anti-LGBT ideology ticket and, um, and, and fervently on an anti-LGBT ideology ticket. And, and, and I think that that's interesting in two respects. And I'll say this in closure. The first is uh, the fact that he just squeaked in to victory in the narrowest election that democratic Poland has ever had even though there was much more space between him and his contender at the beginning of the campaign. And this is because of the way there is such, in a country like Poland, in a country like the United States, such division around these issues. And, and that there, there are maybe not a majority in Poland, but, but a, a very sizable minority of people who, who would say, actually, um, being tolerant of and supporting queer people is a mark of modernity that we want to sign on to. We like Europe. We like the world. We, 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 we want to be seen as part of this world. Um, that's the one thing I would say about it. So, so, and I think it's important to see how, how these, or to acknowledge that these divisions are going to be very much part of, of national and regional politics for a long time to come. That there's not going to be the sort of easy hegemonic victory of one over the other. But, but, but finally, um, the use of that term LGBT ideology, I think is really significant because the campaign was very clear that we're not, we're not this isn't against people, it's against a contaminating ideology. And this is, I think, uh, where, where religious right-wing nativist um, pink line politics are going against what's increasingly called gender ideology. Um, and and, and it, there's, there's two reasons for this. The first is, is that um, it then allows this movement to present itself as counter hegemonic against the hegemony of George Soros, of, of Brussels, of Washington DC, but also because increasingly everywhere, um, due to visibility rather than hyper-visibility, more and more people know more and more people who are queer. So um, this was the, the really profound insight as to why 64% of Irish people in 2015 uh, voted uh, for same-sex marriage to be legal, even though the Catholic Church was against it in this very Catholic country. It's because everybody in Ireland knows somebody who's close to them who's gay. So it can't be personal again. It can't be personal uh, in, in the way it might have been able to be before. Um, the, bec because there are so many people in the world who, who voters might know to be 
gay or queer or, or increasingly transgender. And so it's sort of morphing into a, an more into something that's that's understood to be more as an ideological battle and 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 the battle against gender ideology is being sort of enjoined all over the world particularly in latin america but increasingly in the united states too um a, a, around whether it is right to teach children about gender at all um as a concept rather than 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 sex which is divinely ordained and immutable uh, Mark, thank you so much. You gave us so much to think about, especially the notion of you know, COVID-19 making somehow the queer condition chronic in a way. Uh, and to the extent that pink line uh, depends on all kinds of forms of mobility, uh, whether moving out, in and out of the, uh, the street or into a, a space, but also across borders. And what will happen um, to these in, in the near future uh, is something that is quite powerful to think with with the concept of the pink line. We are unfortunately out of time uh, and I do want to thank you very much for joining us um, for what has been a really wonderful preview of an otherwise fascinating uh, and most timely book. Uh, I hope that many of our viewers will have a chance to read the pink line and that we'll have uh, many other opportunities to be in conversation with you.